Aleluia. Thank you, Jesus. If you'll just remain standing for a moment. If you have your, if you have your compass with you today, anybody got your compass with you? People get off course because they don't consult the compass of God's word, but we want to be in the will of God, don't we? Thank you, Brother Hodge. I heard you say amen. I didn't hear anybody else say amen. Amen. Who wants to be in the will of God? There you go. That's what I want to hear today. If you have your copy of the scriptures, why don't you turn with us to Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. While you're turning there, just a little bit of family business. Who loves Sister Maria Manji? Three people, four people. I know this afternoon serving people on the Christmas parade route as they pull in our parking lot is work, but do you realize long before she called this her church home, she experienced your hospitality and kindness being in the parade with the Boy Scouts, and she said, oh, that might be a church I'd be willing to go to. You never know who is on this property that God is dealing with about this. Can you believe it was six years ago last week that we purchased this property? It's just gone by really, really, really fast. And so we are thankful for what the Lord is doing. We also have one anniversary, Robert and Karen Elliott anniversary. We're so excited for you. Yay. I put them together with Gorilla Tape. That's what I did. Just just stuck them together. Amen. So thankful for that. Also, two of my favorite people, uh, my daughter-in-law, Sarah, and my good friend, Jeff Dismukes, had birthdays this week. Could we sing just real quick? A happy birthday to you. A happy birthday to you. May you feel Jesus near every day of the year. A happy birthday to you. A happy birthday to you. And the best year you ever had. Amen. And the Lord has been good to us this year. Multiple, multiple babies have been born. We're so excited about that. Also, two or three engagements. We're so glad for Kara and TJ's engagement. We believe the Lord is going to bring them home. And uh, we're so excited for, uh, I thought I saw Megan and Michael. Are they over there? Oh, I see them now. They moved on me. I see And we're so excited about their upcoming nuptials. And so we're excited for what the Lord is doing. Y'all are not excited for them. I'm excited for them. And and also, please continue to remember Sister uh, Mary Nell, who is still in the hospital, is struggling with her her lungs. And also, Sister Sharon Marsh uh, called me uh, this morning and asked. She had surgery this week, and she is in severe pain and has asked for this church to cover her in prayer. And Brother Bob didn't ask me, but sometimes, oftentimes, it's harder on those who are not in the hospital as those that are in the hospital. Please pray for Brother Bob, that Lord would be his strength. Who's going to do that with me today? If you're our guest, Brother Don, Brother, is it JJ? Did I get it right? Awesome. We're so glad they're with us, and we're glad you were here. My son, Jimmy, is here with us today. I love Jimmy. He is awesome. We love you, Jimmy. And I've seen a couple of you fanning yourselves. It's a little warm. Uh, no, no, don't, 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 don't. But I'm willing to sweat that my good friend Stephen Chester Coates is in the house of the Lord today. Who's glad to see Steve walk in here today? Amen. We, we love Steve. And uh, if you don't know it, we love you too. Mariah, we're so glad you're here. We love you too. Amen. I hope you don't mind me taking time, but... If you came up missing, wouldn't you want somebody to notice? And if you showed up, wouldn't you want somebody to rejoice? That's all we're doing today. The Bible says in Hebrews 6, verse 11, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That you not be slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherited everybody say the promise through faith and patience through faith and patience through faith and patience through faith and patience for when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater he swear by himself saying he hath patiently endured he obtained the promise. I'm so sorry I missed the line. Surely blessing 
I will bless thee and multiply, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Who loves that part, endured? Who likes promise? Who likes enduring? Who likes promise? Who likes enduring? I want to preach a little bit today with the Lord's help. While I am waiting for the promise. What do I do while I'm waiting for the promises of God to be fulfilled? Let's pray Jesus today. Thank you for your word. God, thank you for your people. Our desire today is to know your perfect will while we are waiting on your promises to be fulfilled. We pray in Jesus' name and let the church of God say amen. Why don't you take a minute and greet one another and say, I'm glad you are here today. Amen. Today, we must be honest that we we look at the Word of God and we look at our situation and so many times we continue to wonder how I'm going to receive the promises that I see manifested in the Word of God. I, I will tell you, I have too much material, but be not worried. Uh, I've decided to split this in half, and so you're going to get the B part tonight if you're here. Uh, Lord willing, you will be. And we're going to see uh, why not me, why not God bless me, why not I'm over here, I need it. Today we're looking specifically at while I'm waiting on the promises of God, we must develop a, a methodology. Number one, we've got to find and or claim the promises of God that meets our situation. Who's ever had a situation? To, to, ain't no trouble like family trouble. Who's had that situation? Who, who in here knows what it is to have financial uh, situations and need God to respond in a miraculous fashion and you've gone fishing and you keep catching fish but there's no coin in their mouth can I can I get a witness we we look we keep pouring the the oil out but God don't refill it and we're just wondering where God is at so we go to the word of God and we find a a promise that fits our situation and so we got to find that promise number one number two we got to feed that promise who in here has let your promises die. You've, you've let it just uh, e erode or ellipse your ability to believe. It's not just enough to find a promise, but you got to feed a promise. The Bible talks about like a tree planted by the river of, of, of living water. I, that, that passage is talking about those that would receive the promise of God. We've got to put ourselves in a place that our promise can be nurtured on a regular basis. Let me stop. It's not in my notes. You need to cut some people off your friends list. You need to delete some people from your contacts. You need to break company with some people that are robbing your joy and prophesying negative things about the promises of God. You need to find a place 
in the house of the Lord and be planted there that your promise can be fed and nurtured and what you better find some people that see what God is able to do you better listen to some people who've got some gray hairs and seen God show up time after time after time you need to hear them and let every man be a liar you got to find the promise you got to feed the promise I'm planted in a place where I'm constantly going. It ain't happened yet. But as long as there's life in the body, there is hope. You got to find it. You got to feed it. You got to have faith for the promise. Faith is believing God's word when no one else sees how. Not just everyone else, including you. Faith is when you don't see how, but you believe against all visible things that God can and will bring his promises to pass. You got to find it. You got to feed it. You got to have faith for it. And then ultimately, you got to fulfill the condition of the promise. The majority of times in scriptures where God makes a promise, it is a conditional statement. If you will, if my people will humble themselves, then I will heal their land. We want the healing. We don't want to humble. We want to have power over the devil. Get away, devil. The Bible says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God and resist the devil. See, it's conditional. It's not just because you want it. It's when you've obeyed God's condition. Who knows that God is no respecter of persons. But he is a respecter of those who have met the conditions. Hebrews 10 and 35. Cast not away therefore your confidence. Which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience. That after ye have done the will of God. Ye might receive the promise. The word says first that the will of God be done in you. It is not the will of God for you to cohabitate with somebody who is not your married spouse. When we do things or fail to do things that we know we should do, but then we want to proclaim and declare and have faith for the promises of God, we need to go back and rewind the tape and see what in my life is not in conformance to the will of God for me. It's not his will that any should perish, but do people perish? They die every day lost because why? You have free will. If you choose not to acknowledge God in your members, God will accept that as your decision and he will respect it and you will reap the consequence. You heard promises you thought it was going to be all positive. God's promises are yea and amen. The yay is I want to do something, but the amen is where you speak a word that you accept the conditions of his promise. So we understand we got to find a promise, feed a promise, faith for a promise, fulfill the conditions of a promise. But what do I do while I'm waiting? What do I do while I'm waiting? Anybody here love waiting? Who loves waiting in line? Waiting to get your table at Cracker Barrel on Thanksgiving. Who loves that? Jimmy, would you do me a favor and close that door right there? Thank you, Rodney. If you can hear what's going on in the bathroom while you're preaching, it's a distraction. I'm just going to tell you. I don't like to wait. If I go to a restaurant and the wait's too long, I may go somewhere else. Any of you people crazy enough to go Black Friday shopping besides my daughter-in-law? I sort of say, y'all need the Holy Ghost. Y'all may have the Holy Ghost, because how could you endure such weeping and gnashing of teeth lest ye have the Holy Ghost? I don't like to wait. I want patience, and I want it now. (laughs) Does it work that way? No, it does not work that way. God wants us, we see it over and over again, to have patience while we're waiting for God to fulfill his promise. Those that endure to the end shall be saved. Here's what I'm trying to say today. Can I give you an acrostic 
an acronym. Using the word WAIT, W-A-I-T. The W in WAIT, everybody say worship. Who knows that while we're waiting, sometimes it's hard to worship. Who's ever walked the floor waiting on a phone call? Who's ever tossed and turned when you should be sleeping because you don't have an answer yet? Who's got impatient and made hasty decisions? A poor substitute or a counterfeit for the perfect will of God. You slip one in on God. See, Abraham had a promise that would come through his wife, Sarah, but he got tired of waiting, so he took Hagar to be... See, guys, too many times we get impatient while we're waiting, and we quit worshiping, and we start working it out ourselves. And we compound our life's difficulties. Who's ever cut a corner? Who's ever climbed a fence that God put in your... And we make our situation harder. But I love what Psalms 34 and 1 says. I will bless the Lord when I'm doing well. I will bless the Lord when it goes well with me. I will bless the Lord when I get my way. I will bless the Lord when the pastor says it's okay for me to do what I want to do, whether it's the will of God or not. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. You don't understand the context, maybe, but David, who had slew Goliath the Philistine, found himself banished from the blessings of God. He obeyed God, but God's people didn't want him to be king, for Saul would not relent. And Saul was trying to kill him, and he chased him into the land of the Philistines. And he's in the hometown of Goliath, and the king of the Philistines, he is standing in his presence, and his right-hand man says, that's David who killed Goliath. And the Bible says that David became afraid. In his circumstance, he's surrounded by the Philistines. And they know that he slew Goliath. And the Bible says in his fear, he began to drool and foam at the mouth and act like a crazy man and scratch against the gate and begin to foam at the mouth and scratch against the ground. And he says, get this crazy man out of me. And he was set free. It was at that time that David said, when he was afraid for his very life, When the promise of God had not been fulfilled and the people of God wouldn't accept him as king and Saul was trying to kill him, he says, I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. Whether it's going well with me. I I don't think you're getting it. I'm trying to tell somebody today, when you're going through stuff, it's those who endure. And how you endure, how you make it while you're waiting on God to fulfill his promise in your life. To bring your kids and grandkids back to the house of the Lord. When you're waiting on your marriage to be restored. When you're waiting on your financial situation to turn around. You better develop an ability at all times to worship God. It was at midnight that Paul and Silas were in the prison. Everybody else was having a pity party. But the men of God said, even though I don't like where I'm at, I'm going to lift up the name of the Lord. Why worship? Number one, because God is worthy to be praised. Number two, because it keeps our focus on the right thing. Jesus is still the answer. The church is still the only way out of here. God's word is forever settled. If I'm going to make it, i got to lean on the Lord and not on my own. You let the enemy, the devil, get your eyes focused on your problem. If I have one more conversation with persons that says, I want to change and I want to do better, and they spend all their time talking about the problem, and they never want to hear about the solution. Worship gets my mind back, not on my problem, but Jesus is still the answer. Jesus is still the door. God is still able. He can make a way where there seems to be no way. I'm going to worship God because he's faithful and because I got my focus on him. I'm talking to somebody specifically today that knows what it is. You're being crushed by the weight of your circumstance. I want you to know... 
the Bible is very clear that when we're at our lowest places, that's when the enemy, the devil, sends a spirit of heaviness on you. Who's ever had that thought, I just ain't going back to church? I didn't expect many of you to raise your hands. Those who raise your hand, God's going to honor your honesty. Who's ever been at a crossroads? You're going to give up on that promise. Let go of that dream. Ain't never going to happen. It's too far, too much. God's unable. Do you understand by definition, blasphemy is when you declare what God is or is not able to do? You better be careful saying what God is and is not able to do. God can do all things. Amen. Did Satan come to Jesus when he's walking on the water? Did Satan come to Jesus when he's preaching in the temple? Do you know when Satan came to Jesus? When he was alone in the wilderness at a low place fasting. You hear me, the spirit of heaviness will catch you at your lowest place. The enemy wants to get you down for a three count. He wants to defeat you. He wants to destroy you. And when you're struggling in your circumstance to believe that your promise is ever going to come to pass, he will send a spirit of heaviness to finish you off. I love the prophecy of the book of Isaiah 61, verse 3. To point of them that mourn in Zion, to give unto the beauty of ashes and the oil of joy of mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Woo. Maybe you don't get it. When Jesus came, he did more than just die for your sins. He has come to trade your mourning into joy. He has come to trade your worry into faith. I'm preaching to somebody today. If you'll worship the Lord. If you'll lift up the name of the Lord. When you're at your worst. God will show up at his best. Maybe you don't think I know what I'm talking about. Quite a few years ago now. I made a bad financial decision. That situation put us in a ruinous path. And there seemed to be no way out. I realized that years of work and sacrifice because of the decision I made could ruin us for a long, 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 long time. Me and the whole family in a bad place. For a day or two, I was almost catatonic. You may not know what catatonic means. It means zombie-like. I don't remember exchanging more than just a few words with my wife. Don't even remember talking to the kids. I was in a funk, we like to say. I was just, it was just all went... <clears throat> for this much, I could have packed a case and loaded him up and just, just hightailed it, just escaped, just found a new city, a new town, a new identity. And they didn't know that till I just told them. It was bad. But Howard, I didn't know what else to do. I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I hadn't slept a wink. Got up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I went to the church. I found me a place of prayer. And I got down on my side. I said, God, you know it's me. My decision, my mistake. I didn't consult you. I just did it. I was doing it in the name of doing something good for the kingdom. But I, I didn't do due diligence. I didn't handle it right. It's amazing how those wheels, when you start taking ownership for your actions, that weight that's holding you down begins to light, lighten up. Within just a few minutes of saying, God, this is who I am. This is where I'm at. This is what I've done. Can you help me? <clears throat> Within a few minutes, I didn't remember doing it, but my posture changed from that of a broken person that I raised back on my knees and began to lift my hands. Do you know what happened that started out in, in total honesty and repentance before God of where I was at and that I needed his help? It transformed me from a broken mass on the floor to before I got done in that 20, 30 minutes of prayer. I was dancing before the Lord. I was saying, thank you, Jesus, tears running down my face. Somebody showed up at the church about that time. They thought pastor had had a breakdown. You know what? Sometimes we need a breakdown. Sometimes we need to get down to business with God. I want you to know that in that circumstance where there seemed to be no way out, guess what? God showed up in a mighty way. Two or three miracles, two or three impossible things happened. Two or three beneficial things turned around. And what I thought was utter ruin, God works all things together for good. If we let him. 
Do you know what gave me hope to lift the weight of heaviness that was about to crush me to cause me to pack my car and find a new place? Do you know what gave me the endurance to say I can go another mile? I can stay another day with God. I can do this when I continue to worship the Lord. Do you know why it's important when you're still waiting on your promise to be fulfilled is not to rein it in and close your windows and have a pity party. You better learn how at all times to utter your voice towards God if blessings and say, I'm going to worship you. The W in wait is worship. The A, ask for wisdom. Ask for wisdom. The A is ask for wisdom. Who in here admits that you don't know how to get out of your circumstance? You don't know how to fulfill your promise. You don't know how to change what's going on. You can control you to some degree, but you can't control other people. And when you don't have control over other people, you have no absolute certainty of the outcome. Ask for wisdom. James 1 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall in diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect or mature work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, this is talking about the process of what to do while I'm waiting, ask God that he giveth to some men, most men, all mankind, liberally and unbraided not. That unbraided not is lost in the old English. You know what that really means? Who's ever asked a coworker, uh, what's our passcode for this transaction on the computer? 7339, stupid. <laughs> Who's ever asked a question because you didn't know and been made to feel about this tall? Like, duh. Do you understand that when you ask wisdom of God, he's not saying, duh, stupid. He's saying, hey, here's the answer. Want to know more? Want to know more? Want to know more? Want to know more? Wanna... He's waiting for you to ask him. But he honors your free will. If you think you can handle it, he will let you. But if you say, I need help. While I'm waiting, I'm going to worship God. When I don't like and understand what's going on, and I don't know what my next move, I'm going to ask God for wisdom in my circumstance. Oh, pastor, that's not real practical. Let me tell you, it's very practical. The Bible tells us that David, when he was king, there was a famine three years. And after three years, the crops were failing. They were an agrarian society. They lived on the trading and commerce of produce and cattle, sheep, Livestock. Three years of drought, ain't nothing growing, including the, the livestock. And after three years, David inquired of the Lord. Stop. How many years are you going to wait? I don't know if I'd have waited three years. How long have you been waiting to ask God for wisdom? The definition of insanity is do the same things the same way and expect a different result. If what you're doing is not working, why you keep doing what you're doing the way you're doing it? While I'm waiting, I'm going to ask God. Do you know what it turned out to be? I don't have time to preach this. When David inquired, the Lord showed him it was something that was done while Saul was king that needed to be corrected. Sometimes we get a hold or inherit stinking thinking. We got it from our parents or our grandparents. There's some things in our life we need to let go. I don't care what they did. What is God calling you to do? Well, they were never baptized in Jesus' name. But what is God calling you to do? They never received the Holy Ghost with speaking in tongues. I don't care. What are God calling you to do? You got to correct some things. My personal favorite story, I did a little side job a few years ago, and the house, that had air conditioning, but these people were fitness, fitness people. They're crazy fitness people. And they thought the AC in June and July should be set on 79. You might as well not have any AC if you're going to set it on 79. My mother came to visit a couple of years ago, and she says, Woo! You could hang meat in that room you got me. And I said, yeah, baby, and you're it. (laughs) My house, my thermostat. What's funny about that, when I grew up in their house, that's what they told me, my house, my thermostat. (laughs) You better be good to your kids. They're going to choose what what, uh, nursing home you go to. (laughs) They never tell you you're awesome. (laughs) Hey, Brian, never tell you you're awesome. 
Love you. Love you. Okay, I cut some heat on for I, I did. It, it was fun. These people were crazy about not running the air conditioning. And so I worked inside. You know, they got the air on its inside, so I don't need any air conditioning because I shouldn't be. But I sweated perpetually for three days, and I really pushed hard to finish this little job. We were raising some money for something here at the church, and so I was doing this job to collect the money so we could do an offering. I forgot what we were giving it to. And I was working really, really, really hard, and I got home, and Julie had prepared me. I believe, I'm not mistaken, one of my favorite dishes, Mexican chicken casserole, and she fixed it, and she brought me my plate, and she brought me a glass of ice water, and it was awesome. And I sat there, and the longer I sat, there I started going blind it started up here and slowly it came down I kept shaking you ever do that shake your head it'll straighten up that'll straighten it up that'll fix it yeah I'll just do that ignore it it'll go away y'all yep. are laughing but that's what y'all do Amen. when it got about halfway I sprang up out of my seat and Jules said everything okay I said I'm fine because that's what us guys do denial solves everything right if it doesn't exist, we deny it exists, it's not going to hurt you, right? How's that working for you? Just saying. And I went in the kitchen, and I was at a point, I was about to faint. I was about to collapse. I could feel it, that cold, clammy feeling, and dizzy, disordered, and about three-fourths blind by this time. I couldn't see. It's like the lights were just going on about right here. And all I can see is the countertop in the kitchen. And I said, God, I need wisdom. The Lord says, put salt in that cup and drink it. And I mixed it up. And I drank it down. Do y'all know I don't like salty, 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 salty stuff? And I did it a second time. Put some warm water on in the sink where it dissolved. I drank two glasses. And I walked back into the bedroom where Julie was at. And I said, hey, I'm going to take a shower real quick. If you hear me collapse, call an ambulance. When I get out, if I don't feel any better, you can take me to the ER. That's what every wife wants to hear. And the Lord, I'm in the shower because nobody wants to go to the ER dirty, right? I think I'm helping some people. And it was like about three to five minutes, boom, boom lights came back on. Got out of the shower. She said, you ready to go to the ER? I said, no, I'm better. Sat down within 30 minutes. I was just about normal. She tells me later, I read an article, you could have died of salt poisoning. Thanks. I'm glad I didn't know that in advance. I'm not a doctor. I didn't know what was wrong with me. Talking to my brother-in-law, he said, man, you were dehydrated. Do you realize that your heart could have gone into AFib and all this other stuff? Don't ever do that again. I said, I don't plan on it. it that wasn't on my radar. I wouldn't plan on that. It just happened. What are you talking about? When you ask God for wisdom, you don't have to go to college to do it. If you'll ask God, he will give you wisdom that you didn't read in a book, that you didn't see on a Google YouTube video, you didn't learn by watching any other man. God can give you wisdom if you'll ask him. I'm going to worship. I'm going to ask him. Number three, I'm going to incline my ear. Everybody say incline my ear. That really means listen. Jill and I have got some friends, minister friends. You ever had people say, hey, I called you for some advice. And you give them time to lay out their question. And before you can say anything, they go into their reasoning for what they think the answer is. And they say, well, thank you for helping. Bye. And you never said a word. Glad I could help. Sometimes even saints, as hard as this is to believe, come to pastor with problems and they're looking for answers. And they come and they frame the question in just such one way, you can only answer it to fulfill what they want to hear you say. It's kind of like a wife saying, this has made me look fat. How are you going to answer that? I am mannequin man. And some of you have times have come and asked for advice, but then you give me what you think the reason is. You say, thank you for helping me, Pastor, and you're gone. I was like, glad I could help. See, too many times we worship and we ask, but we don't listen because we don't want to hear because we want to do what we want to do. 
Y'all were with me until I started talking on that one. You got to listen. It's not enough just to pray. It's not enough just to worship. At times, you've got to learn how to listen. Turn the television off. Turn the radio off. Take the buds out of your ears. Listen to what the Lord is saying. Too many times we're going around together everybody else's opinion instead of the one opinion that matters, which is God's. Amen. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter, in Ecclesiastes says. Our job is to hear and obey the Lord. So we got to worship. We got to ask. We got to incline our ear. Proverbs says. Then we also we got to take a stand. Many of you know this. The Bible says. It, Ephesians 6 and 13 it says. Wherefore taken to you the whole armor of God. That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand comma stand therefore it don't say sit it don't say run it don't say holy roll it says stand it's important that we acknowledge this verse in our lives while we're waiting who in here admits you've moved the boundary in your life to accommodate the promise you want to see happen God has not called us to compromise, settle for second best, live in the permissive will of God, take a substitute. God's desire is that we draw a line in the sand and we stand. We got to keep standing. You got to feed it. You got to have faith for it. You got to believe it till it's fulfilled. Your promises that God has given you. If you stand today, you didn't sense that I cut out a bunch of stuff out of concern for your time. I love history. I love history because we learn from what has happened in the past. We are more than conquerors by learning by others' mistakes throughout history. I read a great article of history recently. For many years, 150 plus years, England's naval forces ruled the seven seas they controlled the world's economies because they had control of its waterways but before england had its place the dutch had a navy that controlled the world england and the dutch navies had a battle on the open waters big cannonballs going back and forth the admiral, the chief commander of the naval forces of England, had a large mast. That's that thing in the middle of the sheep. It gives it buoyancy, and also it gives you the bird's nest where you can see for miles, and also gets you where you put your flag that determines who owns that ship and what that ship's position is. That admiral's ship took a direct hit by a cannonball that broke the mast in half, and the flag, the colors that were on that ship, fell to the deck of that ship. All the forces of England's navy buckled, thinking we have been defeated. The admiral has taken the colors down because he is going to surrender. And they almost let the Dutch forces board their ships. But one man, James Crawford, saw the ship starting to give up. Ears bleeding where the cannon fire had ruptured his eardrums. Caught up in a rope and fallen two decks below, cracked his head, blood running in his face, left arm dislocated. He climbed up on the upper deck, wrapped his one good arm around what was left of the mast, and he shinned as high as he could go with the colors in his dislocated hand and a hammer and nails, and he nailed the colors, the flag of the admiral's ship to the top of the mast. Do you realize that when the other ship saw that the admiral had not conceded, they fought on, and they won that battle, and that one battle dictated for 150 years that the English Navy controlled the world. What I'm here to tell you is one person who is battered, one person who's weary and well-doing, one person with a made-up mind or too dumb to quit. I'm not going back. 
I'm not letting go. I'm not surrendering hollowed ground. I'm not going along with what everybody else is doing. Today I have made up in my mind that I'm going to stay with it. While I'm waiting, I'm going to keep worshiping. While I'm waiting, I'm going to keep asking. While I'm waiting, I'm going to keep inclining my ear to hear what the Lord has to say. While I'm waiting, I'm going to keep standing. I'm going to cling to the promises of God. I'm waiting on that backslider to return. I'm still going to declare the Lord is faithful at all times. While I'm waiting on my financial miracle, I'm going to declare the Lord is worthy to be praised. Till I see my family reconciled. I'm going to keep asking. I'm going to keep myself at the altar. I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to draw a line. I will not bow. I will not bend. I will not go back. I will not give in. I will not let go. I will not turn loose. I will not give up. I'm going to keep worshiping the Lord. And Sister Beth plays something today. I'm asking you, are you going to leave here the same way you came in? Well, Pastor, it's just me. Who's bought that lie that no one else has gone through what you've gone through? You get home, look up 1 Peter 5 and 6. It'll tell you. He wants you to know that you're not the only one that's waging a war. You're not the only one that the enemy's coming in low places and trying to discourage you. He is sending the spirit of heaviness to too many and they have buckled under it today. I'm asking you, if you need a financial blessing, if you need restoration for your family, you need joy for the journey, you want to see the family that God has promised you they're going to be saved. Sister Beth's going to sing this course. I want you to step out and fill this altar. God's going to do a work if you'll move today.